Hello again. This is section 9.1, Vectors in Two Dimensions. So what we're going to look at in this unit overall are vectors and then how those are related to all the trigonometry that we've looked at throughout this course. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is talk about what a vector actually is. Okay, so a vector in the plane is going to be a line segment that has a assigned direction. Okay, so basically a vector is always going to have two things. It's going to have a magnitude, which is the length of the vector, and it's going to have some direction to it. Okay, and so those are the two key things that we need to understand about vectors is they have a length or a magnitude and they have a direction that they're pointing. Now, the initial point is going to be kind of the starting point of your vector. And then we're going to put the arrow at the terminal point of that vector um, just to show the direction that the vector is actually pointing. In general, when we denote vectors, we're going to use a lowercase letter. And if you're typing them, we typically bold them. So if you see down at the bottom that U is equal to vector AB, we put that vector U in bold. Now, two vectors are going to be considered equal if they have the same magnitude and the same direction. Okay, so two vectors can only be equal if their magnitudes or lengths are the same and they're pointing in the same direction. And then a zero vector, which we're just going to denote with a zero, means there's no displacement at all. Okay, so it basically like be putting a point in space somewhere that doesn't have any direction, it doesn't have any magnitude to it. Now, we can actually do some operations on vectors. So the first one we're going to look at is what we call the sum, right? So addition. So if we add two vectors together, in general, visually, we typically align them what we call tip to tail. And so notice here we've got vector AB and vector BC, and we've aligned the terminal point of vector AB with the initial point of vector BC. And then the sum of those two vectors is the vector that goes from the initial point of the first vector to the terminal point of the second. So in this case, from A to C, that vector is going to represent the sum of those other two vectors. And you can see at the bottom, we just have a different visual representation. The first one is the same as the top, but the B one actually aligns them where the initial points are together. And then you can create this parallelogram and that diagonal of the parallelogram now represents the sum. Okay, so two different visual representations, but in general, it's always going to be, you know, that addition is going to look like that diagonal there. And now we can also multiply a vector by what's called a scalar. Okay, so basically some real number value that we're multiplying by a vector. So if we start with the red vector, which represents vector V, if I multiply that vector by one half, what that's going to do is just change the magnitude. So notice the direction is exactly the same, but now the magnitude is half of what the original vector was. If I multiply by two and get two V, now we have that vector pointing in the same direction, but with a magnitude that's twice as long, right? If we multiply by a negative value, that's actually going to change the direction of the vector. So now we're switching the vector. It's still aligned the same way, but it's pointing in the opposite direction. Okay. Negative one third changes the direction and multiplies by a third. So now it's one third the length. And then negative two V would be twice as long, but pointing in the opposite direction. Now, in general, for finding the difference or subtraction of two vectors, we can think of it as the same thing as vector addition, just with the second one being a negative. And so that's probably the easiest way to think about it. You can see the visual down at the bottom gets a little bit confusing because of all the arrows and things. Okay, so what I would say in general is just remember if we have u plus v, if I want to find u minus v, I'm just going to think of v as a negative value. And you can kind of see that um, at the bottom and the top. So it's pointing in the opposite direction. And then when I align those tip to tail, now I get that red vector, right, that's pointing up against the other diagonal of that parallelogram instead. So the sum would be the diagonal from the bottom left to the top right. The difference now is going to be the diagonal that goes from the bottom right to the top left instead. All right, now, vectors in general, we're usually going to represent them in what's called the component form. And so you can see here, vector V is equal to A1, A2. It's an ordered pair, but we use these angle braces instead of parentheses to make sure it's clear that we're not looking at a point like we would with like an X and a Y value. This is actually representing a vector now. A1 is always going to represent your horizontal component. So that tells you how far you're moving in the horizontal direction. A2 is going to give you the vertical component, so that's how far you're moving in the vertical direction. 
And then basically it looks like a triangle and the hypotenuse is the vector itself where A1 tells you how far in the horizontal, A2 tells you how far in the vertical. Now, if we're looking for the component form of a vector and we know the initial and terminal points, the, this is the formula we can use to find that vector. So you're always going to start with your terminal point and subtract your initial. So we're saying x2 minus x1 is going to give us how far we're traveling in the horizontal direction. y2 minus y1 gives us how far we're traveling in the vertical direction. And so that is now going to represent that vector v that goes from point p to point q. All right, so let's take a look at this example. We want to find the component form of a vector u has an initial point at negative 2, 5, terminal point at 3, 7. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to label these values just so we can plug into our formula. So the initial point is going to give us our x1, y1. The terminal point is going to give us our x2 and y2. And so remember to find the vector itself. u is going to be equal to x2 minus x1, and then y2 minus y1. So if I do that here, we have 3 minus a negative 2. Well, that becomes 3 plus 2. And then we're going to have y2, which is 7, minus y1, which is 5. And simplifying that now should give us 5, 2 as our vector. Now, the second one here says if we have a vector 3, 7, and it's sketched with an initial point of 2, 4, we want to find the terminal point. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to write my two formulas. I know that my horizontal component is going to be x2 minus x1. I know my vertical component should be y2 minus y1. And in this case, because we're given the vector, we know the a1 value and the a2 value. And we know the initial point, which is our x1 and y1. So now I can substitute those values into these equations to solve for the terminal point itself. So my a1 value is 3. My x2 is the thing I'm looking for. So I'm going to leave that. And my x1 is the x value of my initial point. So that's going to be a minus 2. Now to solve for x2, I can just add 2 to both sides. So 5 equals x2. Now we'll do the same thing with the vertical component. My A2 value is 7. I'm looking for the terminal point, so I'm looking for Y2. My Y1 value is 4, so we get a minus 4. And again, I'm just going to add to both sides here. So Y2 is equal to 11. And now finally, we just need to write this as an ordered pair. We're looking for an actual point this time. So make sure we're not using the angle braces like we did on the previous one. So it's going to be 5, 11, and that point is the terminal point of our vector. Now, another way to think about this is since we know the initial point and we have the horizontal and vertical components, we could just say, well, let's start with the x value and add the horizontal component. So 2 plus 3 gives us 5. Then we can start with the y value, add the vertical component, so 4 plus 7 gives us 11. So that's another way to think through this one if you don't want to use the formulas here. All right, now, we talked about the fact that vectors are going to have a magnitude or a length to them. Okay, So the magnitude or length of a vector is going to be this formula here. So magnitude of v, which we represent using these absolute value bars, so whenever you see absolute value bars around a vector, that means we're looking for the magnitude. It's going to be the square root of the a1 value squared plus the a2 value squared. So we're taking the horizontal component and squaring it, the vertical component and squaring it, adding those together, and taking the square root. This is based off of Pythagorean theorem, right? Because if you saw, right, the horizontal and the vertical create this triangle where the vector itself is the hypotenuse. And so we're really just looking for the length of that hypotenuse if we know the horizontal and vertical components of the vector. Okay, and at the top here, it tells us that two vectors are equal if and only if their corresponding components are equal. So for two vectors to be equal, both the horizontal and the vertical components have to be the same. 
All right, so let's see if we can find the magnitude for each of these now. So remember, we're going to use the absolute value bars, so magnitude of u. And our formula here is going to be square root. We start with our a1 value, so that's 2. We're going to square it, plus, and then we take our a2 value, which is negative 3, and we square that. Now, 2 squared should give us 4. Negative 3 squared is 9. And 4 plus 9 is 13. So we end up with square root of 13, which is not a perfect square, and we can't simplify. So I'm just going to leave my answer as square root of 13 this time. Now, the next one, we have magnitude of V. Again, I'm going to use my formula. My A1 is... 5, so we square that. A2 is 0, we square that. That gives us 25 plus 0, or square root of 25, but the square root of 25 is just 5, so this time we get a magnitude of 5. Anytime you have a vector where one of your components is 0, the magnitude or the length of the vector should just be the other component. So since we only have a horizontal component here, we know the length of this vector is just going to be whatever that horizontal component is. All right, and then this last one, magnitude of W, square root, 3 fifths squared, plus 4 fifths squared. And when we square a fraction, remember we square the numerator and denominator. So it's going to give us 9 over 25 plus, and then 16 over 25. Adding those together now, we have a common denominator already. So 9 plus 16, 25 over 25. And that's just 1, and the square root of 1 is 1. So this time we have a magnitude of 1. Anytime you have a vector that has a magnitude of 1, we can actually call that a unit vector. And we're going to look at some specific unit vectors later that we actually use a lot. Um, but in this case, um, any vector with a magnitude of 1 is called a unit vector. All right, now some algebraic operations that we can do on vectors. So we're allowed to add them. We're allowed to subtract them. We've already talked about that visually. The formulas for that, if I have two vectors, a1, a2, and b1, b2, to add them, all I have to do is add their horizontal components, so that's the a1 plus the b1, and then I'm going to add the vertical components, the a2 plus the b2, I'm going to write that as a vector, and that's going to represent the sum. If I'm subtracting, basically the same thing. I'm going to subtract the horizontal components, a1 minus b1. I'm going to subtract the vertical components, a2 minus b2. That's going to now give me the vector that represents the difference between those two vectors. If I want to multiply by a scalar, so notice here we have c times u, all I have to do is multiply that c value by each of the components. So I'm going to do c times a1, c times a2, and that now is going to give me the new vector. And at the bottom, we can just see a visual representation of how when we add them together, it gives us what we have in those formulas. All right, so now we're given two vectors, u and v. And the first thing we're asked to find is u plus v. So u plus v. And remember to add these vectors, we're going to start by adding the horizontal components. So that's 2 plus negative 1. Then we're going to add the vertical components, negative 3 plus 2. When I add 2 plus negative 1, that should give us 1. Negative 3 plus 2 should give us negative 1. And so our answer for u plus v is just going to be 1, negative 1. All right, then we'll do u minus v. Again, we're just going to subtract the horizontal components to minus negative 1. Subtract the vertical components, negative 3 minus 2. 2 minus negative 1 becomes addition, so that gives us 3. Negative 3 minus 2 is a negative 5. And so 3, negative 5 is our difference between u and v. 
Right, now we'll do some scalar multiplications. We have two times u. So that's just going to be two times vector u, which is two negative three. And remember to multiply by a scalar, we're just going to multiply the two by both components. So we get two times two, two times negative three. Two times two is four. Two times negative three is negative six. And so that is our two u now. Right. The next one is negative 3v. So we have negative 3 times vector v, which is negative 1, 2. Again, I'm just going to multiply that by both components. Negative 3 times negative 1. And negative 3 times 2. Right. When we do that now, we should get a positive 3 and a negative 6. And then finally, we need 2u plus 3v. Now, notice we've already found negative 3v. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and find 3v. That'll just make this easier to add together. So if you think about it, all I need to do is switch the signs of the values that I got at the end here because I'm multiplying by a positive 3 instead of a negative 3. And so this 3v should just be negative 3 and positive 6. And so now if I'm adding 2u plus 3v, adding these two vectors together, so that's going to be 4, negative 6, plus negative 3, 6. And when I add those together, I should get 4 plus negative 3, negative 6 plus 6. And 4 plus negative 3 is 1. Negative 6 plus 6 is 0. And so 1, 0 would be our final answer there. Okay. That would be another example of a unit vector, right? Because notice it only has a horizontal component. So we know the magnitude is going to be 1. Therefore, it's a unit vector. All right, now some properties of our vectors. We already talked about the fact that zero vector we represent as a zero. That means that there is no displacement, which means the horizontal component is zero and the vertical component is zero. It's going to play the same role as zero does for addition of real numbers. So if you add a zero vector to a vector, you're going to get the same vector you started with. Okay. Now, some other properties here. Vector addition is commutative. So u plus v, same thing as v plus u. I can switch the order. I'm going to get the same answer. Associative property also works. So if I group together the v and the w in that second one, or I group together the u and the v, I'm going to get the same answer once I add all that together. We just said a vector plus the zero vector should give you the same vector again. So u plus zero is just u. A vector plus its opposite should cancel out and give us the zero vector. The length of a vector now, if you're multiplying by some scalar and finding the magnitude, we can actually split it up and find the absolute value of the scalar times the magnitude of u. Okay, so in this case, right, if you have the magnitude of c plus or c times u, we can just find the absolute value of c multiplied by the magnitude of u. Distributive property works if you have a scalar, so c times u plus v is just c times u plus c times v. Distributive property also works with vectors. So if you have C plus D, where those two values are actual real numbers, and we're multiplying by a vector, you can distribute the vector to both of those numbers. And then associative property of multiplication works, as you can see down at the bottom, as long as you have two scalars and a vector being multiplied, it doesn't matter how you group them. One times any vector is the vector, zero times any vector is zero, and C times the zero vector is just going to give us the zero vector. So a lot of these properties look like real number properties because the vectors themselves have real numbers in them. And so we can really think of these as almost like our real number properties for addition and multiplication. Now, here's our definition of a unit vector, which I mentioned earlier. So a vector that has a length or a magnitude of one is what we call a unit vector. The two useful ones, the ones we see the most often, are i and j. 
I is the vector, the unit vector, who has a horizontal component of one and a vertical component of zero. The J vector is going to have a horizontal component of zero and a vertical component of one. So again, those are the two most common unit vectors, right, where you have just a horizontal or just a vertical component. Um, and we can actually write our component form vectors in terms of I and J, which we will look at um, on some of these examples. Now, if you want to convert a vector from its component form, A1, A2, into that I and J form, all we do is take the horizontal component, multiply it by I, take the vertical component, multiply it by J, and then add those together. So A1, I plus A2, J is going to be the same vector as the vector that we started with there. So let's take this vector u and let's write it in terms of i and j. So again, all we have to do is take the a1 component, multiply it by i, so that's going to be 5i, and then we're going to take the a2 component, we're going to multiply it by j, so we get a minus 8j. So that right there is just a different representation of vector u. Both of these vectors are equivalent to each other. It's just a matter of how you're asked to write your answer. Okay, the top one being the component form, and then the bottom one being in terms of I and J. All right, now the next one, we got U, we've got V, both in terms of I and J, and they're asking us to write 2U plus 5V in terms of I and J. So all I'm going to do, so I'm going to say 2U is just 2 times 3I plus 2J. Then we're going to add 5v, so 5 times negative i plus 6j. Now, like we said before, our properties here hold, so we can distribute, we can combine like terms. So 2 times 3i is 6i, 2 times 2j is 4j. Then we're going to get a plus, and then 5 times negative i is negative 5i, 5 times 6j plus 30j. Now we can combine the i's, we can combine the j's, 6i and negative 5i is i, 4j and 30j is 34j. And so that vector 2u plus 5v in terms of i and j would look like this. All right, so this is where the trig comes in. So if we're looking for the direction of a vector, we're going to call that direction theta. So it's going to be represented by an angle. So we're going to let vector v be a vector in the plane with its initial point at the origin. So we're always aligning these at the origin. The direction theta now is the smallest positive angle in standard position that's formed by the positive x-axis and that vector. Okay. Now, to find these values, the A1 component, the horizontal component of your vector, is going to be equal to the magnitude of V, which is the length of that diagonal, times the cosine of theta. If you think about it, this is very much related to the polar coordinate stuff that we did in the last unit. So if it helps you to not have to remember a new formula, we're basically saying now that the absolute value of V, the magnitude of V, is like the R value. Because remember, that was like the length of a radius. And we took that and multiplied it by cosine to give us the x value in our polar coordinates. Well, now we're saying the horizontal component is like the radius or the magnitude times the cosine of theta. And then same thing with the, ver the vertical component. That was like our y equals r sine theta. Now we're just saying the vertical component is equal to the magnitude of v times the sine of theta. And as always, we can put these in terms of I and J, so they show you that at the bottom. Um, for the most part, I'm going to work with things in their component forms, um, but it's easy enough to take those component forms and put them into the terms of I and J if you need to. All right, so let's see if we can... 
find the vector here that has a length of eight and a direction of pi over three. So if it has a length of eight, remember the length is the same thing as the magnitude. I apologize for those technical issues. Okay, so here we go. So we know the length and the magnitude are the same thing. So I know my magnitude of V is going to be equal to eight this time. I also have the direction, which gives me the theta value. So I know my theta is going to be pi over three. So now what we want to do is just find the horizontal and vertical components using those formulas we just saw. So remember, A1 is equal to the magnitude of V times the cosine of theta, and A2 is equal to the magnitude of V times the sine of theta. So A1 equals magnitude of V, we just said is eight. And we're gonna do cosine of theta, which is pi over three. So now we just need to know the cosine of pi over 3. So remember, think about your unit circle. The x value at pi over 3 should be 1 half. So we get 8 times 1 half. So our a1 is 4. All right, then define a2. Magnitude still 8. Then we're doing the sine of pi over 3. Sine at pi over 3 is square root of 3 over 2. And when we multiply that now, we should get 4 square root of 3. And so our vector now, vector v, is going to be 4. 4 square root of 3. Now it does ask us to write that in terms of i and j. So again, all we have to do is put 4 times i plus 4 square root of 3 times j. All right, now the second part of this asks us to find the direction of the vector. Now we could use those formulas that we have up at the top, right? The a1 equals absolute value or magnitude of v times cosine theta and a2 is equal to magnitude v times sine theta. I'm going to show you there's a slightly quicker and easier way than having to use both of those formulas, though, because both of those are going to require that we find the magnitude first. There's a way to do this without needing that. And so if you think about it, I know that this right here represents my vertical. I know that this piece represents the horizontal. And if we think about in trig terms, right? The vertical and the horizontal, there's a relationship between those where tangent is equal to that vertical component over the horizontal component. And so what I can actually do here is just say tangent of theta is equal to one, which is the vertical component, over negative square root of three. So it's kind of like saying that tangent is equal to y over x, right? But now we're referring to them as a vertical and horizontal component instead of an x and a y. Now, once we have this, now we can just do our inverse. So theta equals inverse tangent of one over negative square root of three. And so now we just have to think about on our unit circle, where would that happen? And so our options in this case And we know that tangent would be negative in the second quadrant or the fourth quadrant, and it would be one over square root of three at five pi over six or 11 pi over six.
Now, the way we're going to determine which of those to use is similar to what we did with polar coordinates. We're going to go back to the original vector and we're going to think about if it has a horizontal component that's negative and a vertical component that's positive, that means if I were to sketch this out, we're going to have a vector that's pointing in this direction. So horizontal is negative, vertical is positive which means we're in the second quadrant somewhere, which means we're going to take the angle that's in the second quadrant. So 5 pi over 6 would be the direction of that vector. All right, now... One of the most common uses of vectors is actually to model real life situations. So the one that we're going to focus on is velocity. If you take a physics course, you'll look a lot more at force. We're not going to cover that here, though. Okay. So for velocity, the velocity of a moving object can be modeled by a vector whose direction is the direction of motion and the magnitude is going to represent speed. So whenever we're looking at these vectors now, if I find the magnitude, that's going to tell me how fast the thing is moving. And then if I look at the direction of that vector, the actual theta value, that's going to tell me the direction that it's traveling. Okay, so you can see in this picture here now, and this is going to come up in the example that we're getting ready to look at, we have vector V, which is going to represent some motion. We have these U vectors, all the blue vectors, that actually represents a wind field that we're going to look at on the next example. And so basically we have something that's trying to travel north we have this wind field that's pushing it off course and the sum of those two vectors which we're going to use w to represent that is going to tell you specifically where that object is actually moving now okay and this is going to be with an airplane so we have an airplane trying to travel due north the wind is blowing it off course and so we can add those two vectors together to figure out where is that airplane actually heading now All right, so here's our situation. An airplane heads due north at 300 miles per hour. It experiences a 40 mile per hour crosswind in the direction north 30 degrees east. Okay, so that's what we're looking at here. Now, the questions are on the next slide. So it says express the velocity of the airplane relative to the air and the velocity of the wind in its component form. Okay, so we're looking for a vector to represent the airplane and a vector to represent the wind. So I'm going to start here by thinking about the airplane. So I need an A1 component and I need an A2 component. Remember, to find A1, we're going to take the magnitude of the vector and we're going to multiply it by the cosine of theta and then to find the a2 component we're going to take the magnitude of our vector and we're going to multiply it by the sine of theta now the magnitude of our vector represents the speed so if i know the speed of this object i have its magnitude it told us that the airplane is going due north at 300 miles per hour so I know this is going to be A1 equals 300 cosine. And because it's traveling due north, the direction in this case should be 90 degrees. So due north is going to put us at 90 degrees. Right, now the A2 component, same values, but with sine. So this is going to be 300 sine of 90 degrees. Now we just need to simplify these 300 times cosine at 90, right? Think about your unit circle at 90 degrees. X value is zero. So cosine is zero. 300 times zero is zero. A2 component, 300 times the sine at 90 is one. And 300 times one is 300. So my vector for the airplane should be 0, 300. 
And if we think about it, since it's traveling due north, it only has a vertical component. It's not moving left or right. It's not moving horizontally at all. So it makes sense that that horizontal component is going to be zero this time. Okay. Now I need to do the same thing with the wind. So for the wind, a1 equals, this time we're looking at vector u. So it's going to be magnitude of u cosine theta. And a2 equals magnitude of u sine of theta. All right, so we said the speed is the magnitude. So I'm going to go back. This time, the speed of the wind should be 40 miles per hour. So I'm going to use 40 here. So we get A1 equals 40 cosine of. And now we need the theta value. So if we go back and look, notice here our bearing is north 30 degrees east. However, when we're looking at theta values, we always want to measure from horizontal. That 30 degrees is measured from vertical. It's measured from north. So what I actually want to find is this angle right here, 60 degrees, because that's the one that's measured from horizontal. So whenever they give you a bearing, north 30 degrees east in this case, we have to think about what's the actual angle from horizontal. In this case, it's going to be 60 degrees. So our theta this time is going to be 60. And then over here, we have 40 sine 60 degrees. Okay. So now we just evaluate cosine at 60 degrees. One half. Sine at 60 degrees. square root of 3 over 2. And so when we multiply these together, 40 times 1 half is 20. And 40 times square root of 3 over 2 is 20 square root of 3. And so our vector for the wind should be 20, 20 square root of 3. Now, once we've got both of those vectors, we have a vector to represent the airplane, we have a vector to represent the wind. It asks us to find the true velocity of the airplane as a vector. So we're looking for a new vector that represents where the airplane is actually heading. So if we go back and look at our picture, V represents what the airplane's trying to do, U represents the wind, and W, that red vector, is what's actually happening to the airplane because of the wind now. So to find that, I'm going to add those two vectors together. So I'm looking for W, which is going to be U plus V, and that's going to give us that true velocity now. So if we add these together, we've got 0, 300 plus 20, 20 square root of 3. 0 plus 20 is just 20. 300 plus 20 square root of 3 is 300 plus 20 square root of 3. Okay. And so that vector w now represents the true velocity of the airplane. It's telling us which direction it's actually traveling and um, the speed at which it's traveling. That's what's encompassed within that vector. And then the last thing we want to find is what's the tr called the true speed and direction of that airplane. So using that vector, the true velocity vector, now we can find the actual speed and direction of that plane. Well, remember to find speed, we can just look at magnitudes. So the first thing I'm going to do here for true speed, so I'm going to find the magnitude of W. So it's going to be square root. 20 squared plus 300 plus 20 square root of 3 squared. And at that point, I would just go to my calculator. I would put all of that in there, um, and then I would round this off. And so if we do all of that, we should get about 335 miles per hour. 
So the true speed of the airplane now is going to be 335 miles per hour. Always double check and make sure that your answers make sense. We know that the plane was trying to fly at 300 miles per hour. The wind is blowing it off course, but slightly from behind, which is going to speed the airplane up a little bit. And so the fact that we get a speed that's slightly higher than the 300 that it was traveling makes sense in this case. And then finally, the true direction. Remember, we can just use tangent like we did on the other example. So tangent theta is equal to vertical component 300 plus 20 square root of 3 over horizontal component, which is 20. And we'll do our inverse tangent of all of that. And again, I would just go to the calculator at that point, put all of that in there. And so if we do that now, um, we should get about 86.6 degrees as our theta value. Now, if you wanted to write this as a bearing instead, right, remember bearings are measured from north or south. The 86.6 is from horizontal, so we'd have to do 90 minus that. And so you're actually going to get north 3.4 degrees east. Okay, so for my purposes, if I gave you a question like this on a test or exam, I would be fine with the 86.6 degrees if it just asked for the direction. If you wanted to write it as a bearing, though, just remember we need to subtract that from 90 to get that angle between 90 degrees and the angle that we found. All right, and that's all we've got for section 9.1. As always, if you have any questions, please do let me know, and I will see you next time.